is In Focus, a Voice of America exclusive series on China's economic might, including its investments in Africa. Today, a look at the country's massive appetite for commodities. They cannot find a job, they cannot apply for asylum, they are without papers, so they are around the city. And Greek citizens angered by the country's possible bankruptcy target the immigrant community for violence. Kigali has been the center of the fiercest fighting in the civil war. Documentaries are not going to stop genocides or resolve conflict. And in the United States, this year's Silver Docks Film Festival highlights peace building. Hello and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. And I'm Dimyake Mwakalielies. The International Criminal Court in The Hague has issued arrest warrants for embattled Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi and two of his top lieutenants on war crimes charges. Judges announced today that Mr. Gaddafi, his son Sif al-Islam and Abdullah al-Senussi, chief of the Libyan intelligence service, are wanted for killing, injuring and imprisoning hundreds of civilians during the early stages of the uprising to oust Gaddafi from power. The three men are also wanted for trying to cover up the alleged crimes. Meanwhile, rebels in Libya's western mountains say they are advancing steadily toward Tripoli. Rebel forces are fighting intensely with pro-Gaddafi troops on the outskirts of Bair al Granam, 80 kilometers southwest of the capital. Uh, the town is significant because it is only 30 kilometers from Zawiya, a key western gateway to Tripoli and home to a crucial oil refinery. In the Central African Republic, two international aid groups established a radio-based network for tracking rebel groups and alerting people of possible attacks. The early warning system is based on a similar system introduced in Eastern Congo last year. David X has the story. After a five-year campaign of abductions and pillage in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, the Ugandan Lord's Resistance Army rebel group is increasingly seeking new strongholds in the neighboring Central African Republic. The result is a sharp increase in killings, abductions and displacement in a country that lacks the resources to defend every remote community. Now two international aid groups are teaming up to install a radio-based system that can help educate vulnerable Central African communities about the LRA, alert villagers to the rebel group's movements, and play so-called coming home messages that encourage the LRA rebels to surrender peacefully. People here are terrified and very concerned about the Lord Jesus Army, and they want programming that's going to help them know when attacks have occurred and where they've occurred. They want programming to explain who the LRA are and why there are Ugandan troops here. The new FM radio system complements a network of a dozen high-frequency radios set up in Congo last year by Invisible Children, an American aid group. In March of this year, Invisible Children teamed up with the Dutch group Interactive Radio for Justice and a local community group to install the first FM radio in the LRA-affected areas of Central African Republic, in the town of Obo, just north of the Congolese border. In Obo, these aid groups built upon an existing local radio station that was already reporting on LRA movements. The great thing about the radio is that it was reaching the community, uh, but the downside of it is that it only had this li really limited one kilometer radius, uh, and, and uh, to be able to reach people living in Obo and outside, you'd really have to boost that capacity. By installing a new radio and antenna, the aid groups boosted the station's coverage area from three square kilometers to over 1,000 square kilometers. The new radio will relay information gathered by Oboe's 300-man volunteer militia force that scouts the surrounding area. The aid groups say that, with more and timelier information about the LRA, Oboe residents will be better able to protect themselves. They also say that some LRA fighters might heed the coming home messages and lay down their weapons. The local community here has responded in a few big ways. First of all, they've formed local defense forces. I was amazed to see the scale uh, and size of these groups. They've actually created homemade shotguns with homemade shotgun shells. The local defense forces here go out every single morning and every single evening on patrols of the LRA. Other communities could benefit as well. The goal is to expand the early warning network to include three dozen HF and FM radios by the end of the year. David Axe for VOA News. 
In West Africa, Mauritania officials say a raid on a terrorist camp in a joint operation with Mali has killed 15 Al-Qaeda fighters. A military official says that two Mauritanian soldiers were also killed in Friday's offensive in the Wagadu forest region near Mali's border with Mauritania. Al-Qaeda terrorists in the North African affiliate Islamic Maghreb group are using border camps to launch attacks in the region. In northeastern Nigeria, a bombing attack by suspected Islamic militants killed 25 people and wounded at least 12 others on Sunday. Police and witnesses say the attackers, riding on motorcycles, tossed a bomb into a crowd of drinkers at an open-air pub in Maiduguri. Authorities are blaming Boko Haram, an Islamic fundamentalist group, for that attack. China says a visit to Beijing by Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir is being delayed, forcing the postponement of a meeting Monday with President Hu Jintao. The planned four-day visit has been condemned by human rights groups because of China's refusal to arrest Mr. Bashir on warrants issued by the International Criminal Court. Mr. Bashir has praised China for helping his country to blunt the impact of U.S.-led sanctions. He also tells the Xinhua news agency that he expects Beijing to continue to have good relations with both North and South Sudan after July 9th. China's uh, skyrocketing appetite for commodities is creating some global economic and environmental concerns. VOA's Nika Columbant has that story. Chinese government and company officials are signing agreements at a dizzying pace around the world, including places where few other foreigners invest. China's Songhui Mining Group this year signed a copper mining deal in Zambia, valued at $3.6 billion. And Chinese firms are signing other deals in Africa and other parts of the world for access to oil and other commodities to fuel China's growing economy. J. Peter Fahm is an Africa expert with the Atlantic Council in Washington. He thinks Chinese officials have been astute during their commodities buying spree. Much of the money is actually tied up in credits or soft loans for infrastructure or for other products which are linked to Chinese firms. So the amount of cash that governments receive often is much lower than the billion dollar figures that are thrown about. When Chinese companies use infrastructure projects as a payment, for example, like here in Sudan, they often use equipment, materials, and workers from China. Writer David Shin warns that many deals lack transparency. One doesn't always know what they're being paid, nor does one know uh, how clean all of the deals are. Environmental advocacy groups are also concerned. In many parts of Southeast Asia, including here in Indonesia, the environmental group Greenpeace says China's purchases of palm oil, timber and paper contribute to deforestation. Greenpeace activist Busta Maitar is trying to make sure Chinese companies do not break laws aimed at protecting the forest. What I'm seeing now is they much more really careful with their operation here in Indonesia to what you call it, trying to stop being exposed by the NGO, for example. Workers for Chinese companies are also wary. In Liberia, where China has overtaken the United States as the leading business partner, many workers complain of mistreatment and low pay from Chinese bosses. This woman was part of a protest in Monrovia. They have no care, some kind of playful out of, out of us. They're always laughing at, at us, beating up on the job side. You know, you abusing our parents, abusing ourselves. Always, start, if, if you are doing a job and you may little mistake, uh, attorney may will come and kick you. Chinese officials reject these accusations. They also say that unlike Western investors, Chinese investors do not meddle in internal politics. In rural Senegal, the Chinese owner of a sesame seed plant, Reaping Uyang, defends his work. It is not about exploiting the country and taking its money. No, on the contrary, we come to help the country and the rural areas so that they can work and have their own earnings. Most commodity prices have risen sharply since the turn of the new century, coinciding with growing Chinese needs. Economists say the commodity price boom could continue over the next 10 years or so, while China's enormous commodity appetite will last much longer, and its effects will only deepen. Nico Columbus, VOA News, Washington.
For more information on any of today's stories, please visit us online at voaafrica.com. You can also visit us on Facebook. Just search for In Focus. Coming up, economic wars lead to a backlash against immigrants in Greece. Uh, stay with us. Do you love music from Africa and the world? VOA has the latest hits, interviews with the artists, and we are glad to take your requests. The Voice of America has what you're looking for. Join us on the radio or on the internet to listen day or night. Go to voaafrica.com and click on your favorite program. Just follow your ears. Music from Africa and the world. We've got it on VOA. Hit me. I'm Jackson Pungani in Washington. And I'm Nadia Sami in Cape Town. Straight in your face, up front. The best music, hip hop, reggae, bongo flava. Let me see you bob your head like you're dancing or oh, having oh, so much fun. Oh, news about issues that concern you. Charles Lee, that is a problem that is in traffic. That's the way we do it right here on up front. Every Wednesday, 1730 UTC on the Voice of America. Stand up, rise up, up front. Straight Talk Africa, celebrating 10 years of Straight Talk with Shaka Sali. Straight Talk has a new look, a new format, as we launch into our second decade. Shaka Sali, his guests, and the Straight Talk audience, bringing you new insights and in-depth discussions on the issues shaping the African continent and the world. It's Straight Talk Africa with host Shaka Sali on Voice of America Television, Radio, and the Internet. Need a little straight talk? Want to make sense of the world around you? Ask a question. Hear what others have to say? If so, Voice of America has a variety of talk shows for you. Lifestyle, health, politics, youth, sports. We have it all. Tune into our discussion shows on the radio, TV, or the internet. They examine a wide variety of issues and world events not always covered by other media. VOA. Welcome back to In Focus. Greece's economy is teetering on the brink of bankruptcy and anger is rising toward the tens of thousands of immigrants living in Athens. Many Greeks are blaming them for rising crime rates and unemployment and the recent killing of a Greek citizen by an unknown assailant has an un unleashed a wave of anti-immigrant violence across the city. VOA's Henry Ridgewell reports. Afghan migrants Hafiz, Mohammed and Sahil are studying English at an evening class in Athens. Like hundreds of other foreigners living in Greece, Hafiz was recently targeted by anti-immigrant mobs roaming the streets of Athens. His right eye still bears the scars. I was on my way back home from work. When I was walking along the street, there were about six or seven people coming from the opposite side. When they saw me, they didn't say anything. Then when they came near to me, they started to beat me. They didn't say anything. They just started to beat me on my face, on the back of my head, and all over my body. Greece is narrowly close to bankruptcy. Facing soaring unemployment and harsh austerity measures, there is a well of anger building in Greek society. Greece's foreigners are among its victims. This anti-immigrant demonstration in Athens earlier this year was one of many to turn violent. Still, the flow of migrants into Greece shows no signs of stopping. Up to 300 people a day try to cross the river Evros that divides Greece and Turkey to reach the European Union. Detention centers are overwhelmed, so most migrants are released after a couple of days. Nazim Lomani, an Afghan migrant himself, has set up an organization to support immigrants in Athens. They cannot find a job, they cannot apply for asylum, they are without papers. So they are around the city and uh, for all the Greek, the Greece problems, it's migrants' fault and they are paying for. It's, it's, it's a real situation now in Greece. Greece says the rest of Europe should do more to help it with the migrant influx. 
Many Greeks, like Athens resident Nikolaos Sophos, says the country cannot accommodate any more newcomers. The Greeks aren't having a good time. They pay taxes. They have lots of expenses. The quality of life has dropped here in Greece. People who come here from these places, from Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, basically that's where they're from, there are so many and they arrive in such big numbers that no one can control the situation. The attacks intensified after a Greek citizen was mugged and killed in Athens in early May by an unknown assailant. The following day, right-wing gangs began assaulting immigrants whom they hold responsible for rising crime and unemployment. One Bangladeshi guy killed before a few days in the center of Athens. More than 50 people they injured. From this 50 people, 30, around 30 of them, they were in the hospital for a few days. They attacked two migrants' houses, broken the doors, windows, they get inside, they beat in people. They throw a lot of in the migrants' houses. Lomani accuses police of arresting immigrants while turning a blind eye to the violence meted out by right-wing mobs. Hafiz and his friends are among the estimated 50,000 immigrants waiting for their asylum applications to be processed. He has been waiting five years. I feel that we are not safe. We are in danger. We left Afghanistan to save our lives, to live safely. Now we see here that we are not safe. We are in danger. We could die. As the Greek government tries to push through further spending cuts, migrants here fear the hostile atmosphere could get even more dangerous in the coming months. Henry Ridgewell for VOA News, Athens. And it was an exciting weekend in sports and here with all the highlights is Sunny Young with the sunny side of sports and it looks like uh, Sunny, the women's world soccer uh, is taking real center stage. Vincent, the biggest event in women's soccer, the FIFA Women's World Cup football tournament officially kicked off on Sunday in Germany and the host Germans who are bidding for an unprecedented third consecutive title in this women's tournament had a lot to cheer about they defeated canada 2-1 there we see fans in frankfurt cheering on their team and i'm sure they hope uh, the german team will be lifting the trophy at the end of the competition in sunday's other match france defeated nigeria 1-0 nigeria is one of two african teams in this women's world cup the other being equatorial guinea now let's go to Buenos Aires, Argentina, and three of Argentina's top football players, Lionel Messi, Carlos Tevez, and Sergio Aguero, got some kicks and in the process also raised some money for UNICEF. Messi, Tevez, and Aguero kick painted a canvas, a painting, which will be auctioned off to raise money for UNICEF. Messi is regarded by many as the greatest footballer in the world. The UNICEF event took place on his 24th birthday. Lionel Messi is also an ambassador for UNICEF, the United Nations Children's Fund. Finally, let's go to France and in African athletics. Kenyan star David Rudisha has run to the year's fastest time in the 800 meters. David clocked one minute, 43.46 seconds. Rudisha, there we see him in a race earlier, is the reigning world record holder in the two-lap race. And he will be considered a strong favorite for the gold medal at this year's world championships in South Korea. David Rudisha is also the reigning 2010 IAAF Male Athlete of the Year, David Rudisha from Kenya. That's all for now. I'm VOA's Sonny Young, and that's the sunny side of sports. Back to Vincent McCory. Thanks a lot, Sonny, for those updates. And uh, remember, viewer, to look for the sunny side of sports every Monday and Friday right here on In Focus. And it's time now for a short break. Still to come on In Focus, a documentary film festival highlights themes of peace building. We'll be right back.
I am Rod Murray, the host of Hip Hop Connection. Diamond shining all, diamonds, diamonds shining. Hip Hop Connection is a music show where we focus on hip hop as a culture. So we bring in interviews from artists, authors, uh, technology people, a lot of different entities make up Hip Hop Connection. So we just put it all together and try to make a gumbo of uh, information. It's so much talent. And unfortunately, in mainstream radio, you don't get to hear a lot of it. I'm so fly, and I know, yeah. We have people who are lawyers, who are doctors, who grew up on hip hop music, rap music, and R&B and reggae. The lyrics could be French, English, Portuguese, Bantu, Arabic, it is the beat, the African beat that counts, the beat does all the translations, it cuts across all languages and gives us the understanding that this is the African beat. It is so distinct and adhesive. It binds us together. African beat on the voice of America. For more information, visit our website at www.voanews.com slash African beat. Voice of America provides you with African and world news around the clock. Wake up with the Daybreak Africa and in the evening, listen to African news tonight and on weekend, it's Nightline Africa. You can also hear VOA newscast at the top of each hour and World News Now. Visit us online to listen to your favorite news shows or check the latest updates. Go to www.voaafrica.com. Welcome back to In Focus. Silver Docks is a prominent documentary film festival in the United States. The annual event attracts nearly 30,000 people and screens films from around the world on social and political issues. One of the festival's themes for this year was peace building. VOA's Penelope Palou has more. In the Maryland suburb of Silver Spring, outside the nation's capital, moviegoers cluster to watch a broad selection of documentaries. The demand is great. Many of these people are here to watch art films with a political or social message. One of them is Love During Wartime, part of this year's peace-building series at the Silver Dogs Film Festival. Gabriella Beer's documentary is the story of a young couple. Osama, a Palestinian from Israel's occupied territories, and Yasmin, an Israeli. The two marry, but are physically separated, and Yasmin would face hostility from Palestinians if she lived in the occupied West Bank. The two settle temporarily in Berlin, but their lives are in limbo. Beer tells VOA that her film is the human face of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We plan to show the film in both Palestine and in Israel and invite judges, for example, in Israel uh, to see the film because it's one thing to have a law and but I think, I don't know, but if you see what people are really going through, uh, hopefully it would help them. Viewers agree. I think that small human stories like this do a much better job of getting people to build bridges than, you know, pol big policy discussions. It's very moving. Um, really made me see how much I don't know, don't understand, and helped me understand a lot more. Love should reach beyond boundaries. Love During Wartime is one of five documentaries selected for the peace-building theme. I had Asi, I just won't let him go. Tara Sonnenschein is executive vice president of the United States Institute of Peace, which collaborated on the series. The Institute of Peace believes in a whole of community approach, that everyone has the potential to be a peace builder. Sunday 30th, 2006, you watch know, watch in Chad, um, take number three. The film Diary carries a similar message. The filmmaker, Tim Hetherington, attempts to summarize his decade of war reporting in a 20-minute documentary. This is a haunting first-person account 
of what it feels like to be in the front lines from Afghanistan to Liberia. The film's effect is even graver now, two months after Hetherington's death, as he was covering the Libyan uprising. His voice echoes from beyond the grave. I, I, you know, I, there is a political situation or a war or a catastrophe, and I go there to try to, I make pictures to try to understand what is happening there for myself. My father was a young diplomat in 1943. My father the Rescuers by filmmaker Michael King is also from the peacebuilding thread. It traces the story of 12 diplomats who defied their governments to save thousands of Jews from Nazi-controlled Europe during the Second World War. Instead of being honored, they were expelled from their country's diplomatic corps. Filmmaker Michael King made the movie to remind us that genocides continue. I mean, in the 20th century, there was over a hundred million people that lost, lost their lives to genocide. That's incredible. And it still happens today. So the point is that we have Libya, there's thousands and thousands of refugees in Libya, there's refugees in Sudan and uh, Egypt. And where are their rescuers? Where are the rescuers? Where are they? Kigali has been the center of the fiercest fighting in the civil war. Documentaries are not going to stop genocides or resolve conflict. However, they do open dialogue, focus on our humanity, and expand our awareness. Penelope Pulu, VOA News, Washington. Yeah, it looks like quite uh, some offering there, yeah? Uh, powerful, you know, it's, it's always amazes me how much can be communicated in terms of real, real life experiences through these documentaries and how much people really learn, like, you know, the lady in the, in, in the shot there who said she didn't realize how much she knew. Exactly. Yet, uh, you know, thank goodness for these independent film producers who bring out these stories. And, and as uh, Penelope Pulo puts it there very, very uh, accurately, really, mm -hmm. the documentaries, movies really cannot change anything in the world. Right. It takes uh, uh, the powerful people, the governments and uh, officials to really take uh, on these issues. Mm -hmm. But it, they do help to sensitize they people. to sensitize people, to conscientize people, people exactly. become aware. And then from then, movements yeah are built and exactly. then you know who knows it will lead to that Hopefully. kind of change but we'll see the only hope <laughs> only well hope. that's our show for today be sure to watch on in focus on our website at voa dot voa africa rather dot com and for more news please tune into voa's evening radio show africa news tonight at 1600 and 1800 utc and in the mornings to daybreak africa between 0300 and 0600 utc monday through friday thank you so much for watching good night from all of us here in washington good night